Uh, first, on behalf of the workers group, I want to thank you. And of course, the workers group is a revolutionary workers organization organizing the working class of the city of New Orleans and others in the area to work together to bring about revolutionary consciousness among the working class in the city. We do understand that revolutionary consciousness precedes revolutionary action. <coughs> but that action to be helpful to us as a class has to be anchored in a correct understanding of this racist capitalist system that we live in. Without that understanding, we are battling with, with our blinders on. And our task is to remove the blinders which are put on us by the capitalist system that educates us 24-7. 24-7. And therefore, it's very imperative that we begin to really understand kind of society that we did. We in the workers group have been, uh, for the past two years, organizing ourselves, organizing young workers, trying to imbue them with revolutionary understanding. We conduct political studies. We conduct political work. We work in a number of mass organizations, the workers uh, hospitality group. We work in the people's assembly and we also work in taking down And as most people know, this past Thursday, we had a big battle against Zulu. Uh, Zulu continues to insult uh, African-American people in this country by wearing blackface and pretending it's not that. We know that that whole history of menstrual group is part and parcel of the white supremacist structure that runs this country, and that there is no way that one can justify and we continue to use the blackface when she has been confronted with the truth about it. Zulu pretends that uh, black makeup is different than blackface, and of course there is no distinction between the two. And uh, we, of course, are trying to point that out to working people. So as you talk about this discussion that's ongoing between now and my grandmother, uh, we want you to take the stand, of course, that we, uh, who are revolutionary minded understand the impossibility of really forging unity in the class as long as there's this big wedge of racism and ostracism uh, that is being waged by the white supremacist elements all over this country. We know that uh, in Virginia right now that there's a struggle that's going on where the government has been exposed about wearing blackface, but somehow here in New Orleans, we are getting the so-called Zulu exception. That Zulu claims that they've been doing this for 100 years and that they certainly aren't minstrels performing on behalf of a rich white uh, crews. And we know that that is, in fact, the exact opposite of the truth. They, indeed, are the opening act for the Rex Parade. Uh, they come out in their buffoonery with their brass skirts, their woolly wigs, and that is the exact depiction that the white racists did around the turn of uh, the 19th century. And uh, we definitely need to inform people that that's what that is anchored in. But tonight, we're going to focus on the situation in Venezuela. That country has been driven into an impossible situation by the actions of the U.S. imperialist ruling class. They are trying to use every excuse imaginable to justify intervening. But we must stand for the sovereignty of this nation, for them to have the right to elect whoever they want to elect, and their right, of course, not to be interfered with and dictated to by the United States. Just think, would the United States ever accept anybody telling us what are the results of our elections? Wouldn't, wouldn't stand for it, would And so why is it that the Trump administration thinks that they have the right, not only the right, but they think they have the duty to decide who should be holding office in Venezuela? But we know that the awful truth is Venezuela has the largest oil reserves in the world. 
And because of those oil reserves, the United States is back. And Donald Trump, in his gangster <coughs> mentality, says, to the victor goes the spoiler, that he will take that oil and use it as he wants to use it. And we have a duty as revolutionary-minded people, as revolutionaries, we have a duty to oppose this country. And if they do get in a fight, we have to definitely be on the side of the oppressed people and hope for the defeat of U.S. imperialism. Tonight we have two speakers, Comrade Joseph and Comrade Ashley, who are going to go into detail, and then after that we're going to talk about it. So let's go ahead and discuss Comrade Joseph. Uh, Comrade Ashley. Good evening, everybody. Um, I just came from work, so bear with me. There's definitely flowers still in my nose. Um, my, my mind's a little all over the place, so humor me. So the topic of my talk today, the first half of the forum, is really to give a background on the history and uh, repeated actions of US imperialism of interventions in Latin America to sort of set the stage for y'all to understand um, a few things. But first of all, why just as a rule of thumb throughout the world, but even more specifically in Latin America, is US intervention and imperialist violence always a negative thing? Um, so that's one thing that this will set the stage for. Another thing is to understand the effects on the working class in Latin America, but also how that's connected to working class people in the United States and throughout the world, and to also thirdly understand the use of sanctions, the use of economic and political tools to stifle people's movements and also to uh, basically bully other countries into doing exactly what the U.S. and other imperialist nations would like them, for them to do. Um, so, I mean, for example, how many people here know that by 1954 there were uh, 13 out of 20 U.S. funded and backed dictatorships in Latin America. Okay, so that's a good starting point. Huh? <laughs> Guatemala is a good example. Right, I will talk about Guatemala in just a few minutes, if you just uh, bear with me for a second. Uh, to begin with, what I think is important to start with is that as soon as the, uh, the lands in Latin America are colonized, from that moment, there is a huge disparity between um, white settlers, uh, people with more of a connection to the white settlers um, economically um, than there are with the native populations, and then follow, shortly following um, enslaved blacks, and then, then later on freed blacks. Um, in Latin America in general, you have basically two movements towards liberation or independence. So the first wave is basically there are colonies throughout Latin America, then you have new generations of European descent people who are living on these plantations or comiendas or these land masses, right? Um, and they find out for themselves that they want independence, which basically means that they see this free market they see all these goods coming out, and they want to keep as much of the money as possible instead of having Spain exporting all of the wealth to Spain. So you see, throughout the 19th century mostly, and also the 18th century, you see this wave of independence movements, which they really uh, they go off of Latinidad and talking about how we're Latin Americans and all this stuff to really rally up the working class and peasantry throughout the land and get them to fight with them for this independence, but similar to the independence, the war for independence in America, none of these wars really meant a lot for working class people, nor did they mean anything for, at that same time, enslaved people, or the indigenous people who have been genocided against since people first, uh, since settlers first touched land in Latin America. Um, so throughout history, and even to this day, you'll still see links to that, right? Because you have this accumulation of wealth and old money from European settlers that kind of just continues throughout history. And you'll see over and over again um, the oppressed and uh, disproportionate access to resources for Native people 
and uh, people of African descent. <clears throat> Coming into the 1900s, you see the Industrial Revolution, and also in the late 1800s and 1900s, you see the uh, popping up more and more and more uh, what you would call like monopoly capitalism with a lot of the exports that Latin America has to offer, such as coffee, or the one linked to one of the many links to Louisiana, specifically New Orleans, is the banana republics, banana plantations. Um, actually, Tulane University was the site of uh, one of the major owners of the United Fruit Company. Um, and so throughout there, you'll see an increasing interest in U.S. economics in Latin America, right? Because they purposely start setting up these systems for Latin American economies to be dependent on U.S. economies and also other major imperialist forces. Um, so, and you also see increasing rules and laws for tax reforms and tax benefits for U.S. companies. And so it becomes sort of like an economic playground for big business, uh, for U.S. big business. Um, and so that sort of helps to set the stage for the reasons why the U.S. would not want to see any sort of people's revolution, wouldn't want to see any sort of nationalization of industries, similar to the rest of the world, right? But come around the time of World War II, and then following that, the Cold War, there is even a heightened increase in the U.S. wanting to stifle any movements whatsoever, not just socialist or communist movements, but any movements at all that were the, uh, based on organized working class or poor people. So I want to bring up a couple of examples for that so that you can understand sort of like these patterns of behavior. Uh, this is why history is so important because when we know these stories and we know what has happened truly, when we know the real truth, it's not a, it's not a surprise that the U.S. wants to invade Venezuela. It's not a surprise that the U.S. is smuggling arms into Venezuela through Colombia on a daily basis. It's not a surprise that all these sanctions are placed on Venezuela and medical goods can't get in and food can't get in it, and that these companies are breaking their deals with Venezuela. None of this is surprising. Actually, we can almost predict what would happen next, right? Because when you look at the history of Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, Chile, I could just go on and on. It's, it's just the same thing repeating over and over again. The first story I'll tell, I'll give a little bit of information about, is Guatemala. Uh, back in 1950, a man named Jacobo Armenz was, was elected, and he wasn't even necessarily a socialist or a communist. I mean, he did accept the Communist Party, but he was what we would call a moderate capitalist. However, the thing that he did do that really pissed people off in the U.S. was that he nationalized specifically um, the agricultural industry. And so a lot of the land at that time, and also there was laws there where landowners could just murder peasants, and that was completely legal. Um, over 70% of the land was unused, but also owned by the United Fruit Company. And at that time, the Secretary of State had a little family relation with the owner of United Fruit Company, so obviously, that's not going to work, right? Because under our bends, what they did was they nationalized all this land that the United Front Fruit Company had been using, and they said, oh, we'll pay you for this land what you paid in taxes. So how, how much do you think they paid them for the land, right? Yeah. They paid them about $6,000 for the land that they had owned, and the United Fruit Company estimated that to be worth actually $15 million. Um, so they got a little taste of their own medicine, and they definitely did not like that at all. And so what you see is there's a CIA-backed coup that happens in Guatemala, um, and Arbenz has to resign. And this is after a decade of a lot of reforms and huge wins for working class people, because it's not even so much about the leaders, but it's about the mobilization of the masses, the mobilization, mobilization of peasant workers and people throughout this land who had been working on it for centuries to finally see some sort of, of justice, to, for it to be illegal for you to not get killed by the person who owns your land. I mean, that's wild. In 1950, in 1954, like that's what, that's what we were talking about. I mean, it's similar, the narratives are similar throughout the country, but it's just absolutely insane. Um, and so what you see even following that 
is that all the way up until 1960 to 1999 during Guatemala's civil war, um, you have massive CIA-backed and U.S.-funded um, interventions against guerrilla fighters when there is a attempted revolution there. Um, and because people never just gave up, right? Like, our vents resigned, but the people kept mobilizing, kept going. You see a lot of guerrilla warfare throughout Central America, South America during this time, as well as in basically all throughout Latin America. You see a lot of guerrilla warfare. And so what the U.S. does in response to that is even even better than just saying we're gonna we're gonna intervene. We're gonna set up a whole school called the School of the Americas, and we're gonna train Latin people how to become military officers so that they can then go back to their own countries and deal with their issues internally. So we're gonna basically literally make our own puppets to do our work for us. So again, starting in 1946, I know I'm kind of going all over the place, the School of the Americas was set up and it would literally train military dictators, many of which, like Pinochet from Chile, would then become U.S.-backed dictators that are not undemocratically elected into power. And in the case of Chile, over thousands of people, like a whole generation of people would just go missing. And this is where U.S. dollars were going during that time. So, just, um, back to Guatemala though, so you have U.S. backed, trained, and taught dictators um, under, during the Guatemalan Civil War, over 93% of atrocities in which 200,000 native people were slaughtered um, are committed by the government against its own people, and only 3% of the atrocities are attributed to the guerrilla war, uh, to guerrilla warfare. And so you see these narratives, which I'm sure were similar to what we're seeing nowadays about any sort of struggle going on throughout the world, is that these people are committing mass amounts of violence, these guerrilla warriors or these, these revolutionaries are committing mass amounts of violence, and they're the reason why all these issues are happening, they would just stop. No! It's the U.S. funding these dictatorships, it's the U.S. brutal, brutal repression that these dictators have been taught, and that they're then using the cycle movements because it hurts the pockets of major capitalists and imperialists throughout the world, mainly the United States. Because after World War II, the United States had a very vested interest in keeping Latin America under their thumb. Number one, because they didn't want communism and socialism to spread on their side of the world. Number two, because of, again, that dependency of being able to buy, for example, with Venezuela, buy cheap oil refine it, sell it back to Latin American countries, and then also make massive amounts of profit and also use all their tax breaks and reforms and keep the land that they've been owning anyway for hundreds of years. And so just for one country, Guatemala, that's the case with, with their revolution and the repression there. Next, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, sorry, I told you my notes are everywhere. I mean, this happens all over the place, but one of the most uh, clear examples is with Chile, because Chile had always been sort of like in good favor with the U.S. and with a lot of major imperialist countries. Uh, not so much like the mass amounts of people, but the government itself, um, up until 1958, where they, um, the, there's socialist and communist movements, but also mass amounts of working class movements that are mobilizing and organizing around the 50th election. Um, and you have in 1970, Salvador Allende is elected democratically. Um, this sparks a massive amounts of reforms, especially reforms that again, hurt the pockets of US investors and business. Um, so of course, the US doesn't like this, right? So um, you have a CIA, um, so basically during that election, the US massively, massively will fund the opposition. This has happened in many different cases, specifically all throughout Central America, where the U.S. will use our money, by the way, because this is, you, you know, this is U.S. Tax, taxpayer money, um, to fund the opposition of elections to make sure that people who uh, are actually representative of the masses in those countries don't win. 
But however, in Chile during the 1970s election, it actually didn't work. Allende actually won anyway, and so that further aggravates the U.S. and all the little uh, right-wing puppets that they have formed in Chile. Um, and so, because of all the connections, the backwards connections of CIA members, but also the U.S. State Department, the U.S. State Department will use all leverage to cut off international ties um, and international credit to Chile. And so, even though under this government you have massive amounts of wins for working class people, you know, different types of benefits that you see, women's benefits, you have social programs, you have literacy rates going up, despite all that, because none of that matters to the U.S., right? None of that actually is of any importance to the U.S. at all. You have a U.S. back coup. <laughs> in September 11, 1973, in which Allende would, would be killed in the mix of this. And as a result, you have, like I mentioned earlier, Pinochet becomes the dictator of Chile. Following this, again, he was backed and he was funded. You have a massive, massive time of repression in which, again, thousands and thousands of people are missing, artists, activists, revolutionaries, just normal people who didn't have the right attitude just completely go missing. Um, and so even to this day you have mothers of like generations of, of young men who are in the streets still asking where are they. They're called the disappeared. Um, and the U.S. had a major hand in that. Sorry, this <laughs> just always blows my mind when I really think about it. Um, and so over and over again, you have this happening. Um, just some cute little dictatorships by the numbers. Again, Ar Argentina, 1976 to 1983, U.S. backed 14,000 to 30,000 killed or disappeared. We're not even sure how many. Brazil, 1964 to 1985, up to 9,000 murdered or disappeared. Uh, Chile, 3,000 to 14,000 killed or disappeared. Paraguay, 3,000 to 4,000 killed or disappeared between 54 and 89. So basically, post, during the Cold War, all of Latin America is absolutely ravaged by the US imperialist forces, right? You have thousands and thousands of people going missing. You have massive amounts of uh, mobilizations, revolutions happening throughout the regions. And you do have some wins for working class people, but none of that matters to US imperialists. None of it. Just like after the Cuban Revolution, where you have massive amounts of sanctions that keep resources from being able to come into that country, you're going to see that throughout all of Latin America consistently over and over and over again. And so, again, when this happens in Venezuela, where we really cannot be surprised, right? It's not a, it's not a shock. It's nothing that's different um, whatsoever. And so, I know, I'm, I lost my notes, just give me one moment. You're good, you're last thing that I really wanted to touch on after giving some concrete examples and not trying to overwhelm everybody with all these facts and details of like millions of deaths that the U.S. has, uh, has committed throughout Latin America. Um, I just wanted to talk more about sanctions and what they do to Latin American countries, what they do to any country that imperialist forces place sanctions on. Because a lot of the narratives out there make it seem like because of socialist policies or because of um, nationalizations of industries or because of reforms that a lot of these countries are hungry, that they don't, that the masses of people who usually are the ones who are supporting all these things aren't getting the resources that they need, but a lot of that is actually because of sanctions. And specifically with Venezuela, we can look at the actions on behalf of the U.S. since 2000, just, just since 2015 alone, which is not when it started and it clearly is not where it's ended. Um, you can really understand why, so then 
there's these sanctions placed on these countries, and then the same country that places those sanctions turns around and says, they don't have any medical supplies for their people. They don't have any food for their people. Wow, I wonder why. <laughs> uh, in July 2017, US, uh, U.S. City Bank refuses to handle Venezuela's payment for the import of 300,000 insulin doses to meet the needs of 450,000 registered patients. Three months later, U.S. blockade prevents Venezuela from depositing funds with the UBS Swiss Bank, delaying the purchase of vaccines for months and disrupting the country's vaccination schedules. In 2018, $9 million payment through an international account for dialysis supplies for treating 15,000 patients free of charge was similarly blocked under the threat of U.S. sanctions. And so in a country where massive amounts of diabetics in the U.S. don't have access to insulin because of lack of health care, that same country is blocking insulin and massive amounts of medical supplies and vaccines from entering a country where the working class people have mobilized enough to have access to those things. And so the narrative that you get is that the U.S. will go, will ha has no limits on what they'll do to literally bully countries into doing what they want them to do. Sanctions are political and economic actions that can be taken, sort of like a carrot stick model to get countries to do to do whatever they want them to do. Because a socialist country or a country where there's massive amounts of political unrest or you know, working class people organizing, no country can function in this global market without interactions in, in and out. Countries sell, like Venezuela sells their oil, sells resources, buys them back, trades. If you can't do that, then obviously you're going to be a little impaired, right? And so what imperialist countries do is they place sanctions and they, they, they threaten other countries too to not do business with these countries that they have, they have their eyes set out for. And then these countries suffer and then they turn around and they say, look what's happening there. This is why you shouldn't support them. But as we know throughout history and as we've seen with Cuba and as we've seen with various other countries, um, if the people want it badly enough, then it will happen. Um, this, none of this is meant to be like a pessimistic view on revolution or a pessimistic view on working class organizing, but it's rather to be sort of something to keep you going. Because Latin American history, even though there's been massive amounts of oppression and violence and <coughs> all these horrible things, at the same time, none of the people, the working class people, have really ever stopped mobilizing or organizing. Despite working on plantations, right? You know how hard it is? Can any of us even imagine what it's like to work in a cane field? Right, in Louisiana, I mean, there's, there's connected history here, right? If, if, I can't even wrap my mind around that, or being a person in enslavement and still finding a way to organize the revolution. The water wars in Cochibamba in Bolivia in the early 2000s, like water was privatized, connected with the US company, of course, and the water, price of water went, under, went up 200%. You know what you saw? You saw thousands and thousands of people in the streets for months at a time. People who work all day, every single day. And so these people, and throughout Latin America, you see over and over again the resistance and the resilience of the working class people there, just like in Venezuela right now, which my comrade Joseph's gonna take over really shortly to talk about the working class struggle in Venezuela. And so we'll never see any working class people anywhere stop until revolution is won. Thank you. Woo!